Hey, A-plus students, let's cover everything you need to know for the exam for period four. Before we start, print out the speed review sheet to help you follow along with this video. It's free and you can find the link in the description below. Right now, look at period four. Circle any people, events, vocab, things that you might not quite remember that you know you need to focus on as we review. Once you're confident that you've mastered a topic, you can check it off and move on to the next. All right, here we go. Thomas Jefferson's election is called the Revolution of 1800 because it's the first peaceful transfer of power from one party to the next for the young nation. Jefferson faced several foreign policy challenges as president, including the Louisiana Purchase, running with the Barbary Pirates, and the Embargo. Argo Act. Jefferson was conflicted on the Louisiana Purchase because the Constitution did not strictly give the president the power to purchase the territory. Ultimately, he agreed to the purchase because it would further his ideals of an agrarian nation and it doubled the size of the United States. Lewis and Clark, with the help of Sacagawea, explored the territory. The Barbary Pirates incident also conflicted with Jefferson's strict interpretation of the Constitution because he paid a tribute to release American hostages and expanded the U.S. Navy to fight the pirates in Tripoli. Also, when Britain and France tried to interfere with American neutrality during the Napoleonic Wars, Jefferson responded by passing the Embargo Act of 1807. This damaged the U.S. economy and Jefferson's administration, which also caused him to step down after two terms. James Madison was elected in 1808. His first term was focused on the economy, following the failed Embargo Act and the expiration of the National Bank Charter. But his second term was consumed with the War of 1812. Also known as the Second War of Independence, America went to war with Great Britain because of continued impressment of American sailors and because Britain continued to supply natives on the frontier with weapons. Young Warhawks in Congress like Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun supported the war. While Democratic Republicans from the South and the West voted in favor of the war, Federalists opposed it. This led to the failed Hartford Convention, where Federalists held a secret meeting attempting to limit the growing power of the Democratic Republican Party. Two events from this war that you want to know are the Battle of Baltimore, where the Star Spangled Banner was written, and the burning of the White House by the British. The war concluded with the Treaty of Ghent in 1814. The British agreed to end impressment and abandon the forts in the Northwest Territory, and both sides agreed to help end the African slave trade. News of this treaty, however, did not reach Andrew Jackson, who led the Americans into victory at the Battle of New Orleans after the war was over. After the war, America entered a period of patriotism and nationalism known as the Era of Good Feelings. America experienced economic prosperity and political unity with an era of Democratic-Republican leadership. James Monroe, the third Democratic-Republican president, also served two terms. He is most known for the passage of the Monroe Doctrine, which reaffirmed America's isolationist foreign policy, demanding Europe stay out of the Western Hemisphere. But the vast differences between the Northern and Southern economies continued to increase sectionalism. Henry Clay's Missouri Compromise attempted to ease these tensions. Missouri entered the Union as a slave state and Maine as a free state, helping to maintain the balance in Congress. This also created the 3630 line to help determine whether new states would allow for slavery. Clay also proposed the American system, which included the development of a national economy through government-funded infrastructure, a protective tariff for American manufacturing, and the Second National Bank. The era of good feelings came to an end in 1824, following the election of John Quincy Adams in what became known as the corrupt bargain. Andrew Jackson felt the House of Representatives had cheated him, leading to a split in the party. This coincided with the expansion of white male suffrage, which resulted in Jacksonian Democrats electing him in 1828 as the common man president. Jackson's administration was dominated by controversy, including the nullification crisis surrounding the tariff of abominations, the National Bank, and the Indian Removal Act. His political opponents accused Jackson of being a tyrant as he ignored Supreme Court decisions and excessively vetoed bills. Their hatred of Jackson led to the formation of the Whig Party. Now let's look at the Marshall Court. John Marshall was a Federalist judge appointed by John Adams. He served as Chief Justice for 34 years, and pretty much any decision of the Marshall Court expanded the power of the federal government over the states. Cases under Marshall include Barbara v. Madison, which established judicial review, McCullough v. Maryland, which upheld the constitutionality of the National Bank and granted Congress implied powers, and Gibbons v. Ogden, which ruled the federal government could control interstate trade. Marshall also ruled in Worcester v. Georgia that the federal government did not have have the right to regulate Native American land, a decision Andrew Jackson ignored. The Industrial Revolution also took place during period four. It's often referred to as the Market Revolution. It's characterized by innovation and industrialization. Northern cities, especially along waterways, saw the development of textile factories, while the West saw the mechanization of agriculture with the steel plow and the mechanical reaper. And the invention of the cotton gin made cotton king of the Southern economy. This also included a transportation revolution. The development of the steam engine led to innovations like railroads and steamboats. The national economy boomed from the introduction of interchangeable parts, and the telegraph connected regional economies. All of these changed America's workforce through the use of unskilled labor. Many of these jobs were filled by women, children, and immigrants who were paid low wages. Poor young women often worked in factories like the Lowell Mills but returned home when they got married. However, women in the upper class and new middle class did not work, reaffirming women's roles in the household. Starting in the 1820s, large numbers of Irish and German immigrants came to America. The Irish, escaping the potato famine, settled predominantly in northeastern cities and took jobs in factories or building railroads. The Germans, who were escaping political turmoil, often settled in 
in the Midwest. Many Americans resented the influx of immigrants. Poor white men living in cities felt groups like the Irish were taking jobs from them. Protestants also resented the increasing number of Catholics. This all led to the creation of the nativist Know Nothing Party. The Second Great Awakening increased church attendance and inspired social and moral reforms. The abolitionist movement called for the end of slavery. Leading abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison published The Liberator and founded the American Anti-Slavery Society. Frederick Douglass, who was formerly enslaved, wrote his personal narrative illustrating the cruelties of enslavement. The women's rights movement met at the Seneca Falls Convention, led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. They drafted the Declaration of Sentiments calling for equality. Additional reforms include temperance, education, prison reform, and mental hospital. America also saw the development of utopian communities, romanticism, and transcendentalism. Transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau called for civil disobedience, and Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote about the truth found in nature. So what does this look like on exam day? For causation, you could be asked about the development of a national identity or the effects of the market revolution. Comparison questions will center around nationalism versus sectionalism or the differences in the various reform movement. For change and continuity, you will likely see questions about changes in political parties or changes in the role of women. Check out the APUSH Ultimate Review Packet for more help. We've got timelines, study guides, and essay practice. Check out the link in the description below to get a free preview. And if you think this video is helpful, like and subscribe.